Father, we thank you for today. We rejoice and are glad. We ask that you come into this youth group message. That you fill this message with everything that everyone needs to hear. That you inspire us. And that you give us the words to speak and the ears to hear in order to have an impactful message filled with you and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Welcome to the second week of our Signs and Wonders series. We're discussing different miracles in the Bible, their significance, and sometimes even the evidence that they actually happen. Before we get into the miracles for today, I do want to recap a little bit of last week, because it's important to have a good foundation of the message. And so when talking about miracles, important to know what miracle means. So miracle, definition in the best context that we can find is a surprising and welcome event that is not explainable by natural or scientific laws. It is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency, of a divine nature. It can't happen normally by itself. Now, also last week, we covered two stances on gifts of the Spirit. Miracles. Things like driving out demons or miraculous healings. Whether or not they happen today. The group of people that believe that the spirit, gifts of the Spirit don't happen today, does anyone remember what they're called? Cessationists, thank you for the assist, Crystal. This group believes that miracles don't happen today. That when the Bible was finished, when scripture was written, that the gifts of the Spirit weren't necessary. The message had already spread far enough. The group that believes that miracles do still happen today are called what? Anyone remember? Continuationalists. It's a big word, but they believe, you know, the way you remember is they believe that miracles continue. Continuationalists. Which do we follow? Why? Okay, yeah, it's a good argument. So, just because we don't personally see gifts of the Spirit manifest, like healings, like driving out demons, does that mean that they don't exist for today, or that just we don't see it? Yeah, that's true. It's a good argument. We don't see air, but it's still there. And so... At the end of last week's lesson, we said that cessations, cessation of the gifts of the Spirit, is basically putting God and the Holy Spirit's power in a box. We are perceiving nothing as far as the gifts of the Spirit, so therefore it must not happen today. Where is God's power in that? God can pretty much do what he wants. If he wants the gifts of the Spirit to happen today, if he wants miracles to happen today, he's going to make it happen. Right. And so and and you know, truth be told, we also attacked this last week with the enemy. If the enemy has power for witchcrafts or spells or psychics or tarot cards, then why would God limit us and our power and the authority that He has given us? Especially when we see what Revelation says. We didn't cover this last week, but with Revelation, it said did I put this slide up? 
No, I didn't. All right. So, Revelation 13, chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. It's not in your notes, but write it down if you, if you, if you have something. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. This is in the end times, the tribulation. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And so, look, I mean, this is not my opinion. This is objectively the book of Revelation. And it says that the enemy in the end time is also going to perform miracles. So, does that mean that we're limited in our power when the Bible and Scripture clearly tells us that the gifts of the Spirit help us drive out demons, speak in new tongues, drink de any deadly poison, it shall not harm us, and then lay hands on, pe on the sick and they will recover? It doesn't necessarily mean that that stops, especially if the enemy has power and to do miracles as well. And so if the enemy is not restrained in his power to perform signs and miracles during the tribulation, then why should it stop for us when we are trying to advance the kingdom of God just like Jesus asked his disciples to? When he gave them power and authority and sent them by twos out in the land, why would we say God's power is restricted when it clearly isn't? And so, now that we've established our position, and that miracles still exist today, and that God, through the Holy Spirit, can still operate, let's look at over two different types of miracles in Scripture and show some examples of them. The first ones that we're going to cover are transformational miracles. Turning one thing into something else. Transforming something into something. So transformational miracles happen in the Old Testament, old school. Things like Egypt's waters turning into blood and during the ten plagues. Yeah, Israelites' clothes, they resisted wear and tear in the wilderness. Jesus turning water into wine, that's the New Testament. And then Jesus withering a fig tree. Those are the transformational miracles we're going to cover today. We've got a lot to do and a lot of scripture to take care of. So hold your questions. The other type of miracles we're going to cover are multiplication miracles. Taking a little bit and turning it into a lot of it. So oil for the woman and her son back in the Old Testament. Manna and quail for the Israelites. Fish and loaves of bread. Here we are back in the New Testament there. And then water from a rock? Where is that at? What? That's back in the... Well, that can... Yeah, pretty much can. Yeah, absolutely. But first, let's cover the first miracle. Egypt's waters into blood. Who wants to read this? Okay, Crystal, go ahead. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Woo! So, yeah, what? Water turning to blood. If that's not miraculous enough, like some people... Some modern-day, you know, scientists try to say, oh, this is just like a red algae bloom in Egypt. No, it didn't say red algae. It said the waters turn to blood. How is that? A, does water turn to blood every day? It's a judgment. It's still a miracle. It's still something that does not naturally occur.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole Nile. It was a big river. That, like, look, that crashed, not, that crashed Egypt's economy. Pretty much. Like, all the fishing there. Done. The fish died. And, and look, you can't find water. It's blood. But look at what it also says here. You don't see this in your, you know, cartoon Moses stories. It says, the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. Yeah. The Egyptian missions cop magicians, they copied this miracle. Yeah. Secret art, witchcraft. They had power worshiping their false deities and gods. But we have power too, even today, with the gifts of the Spirit. And our power is better because Jesus, one of the last things he told his disciples, was that he has all authority in heaven and earth. So those Egyptian false gods, they don't have any authority anymore. It's all authority given to Jesus. Yes, sir. Hey, that's another transformation miracle. More than likely. So Moses and, and Aaron, you know, Aaron threw down his staff, turned into a snake, ate the other snakes that were originally staffs that the magicians threw down. And in order to turn that snake back into a staff, what did they have to do? They had to bend down and pick up that snake by a tail. Yeah. How much faith over fear did that take? I know, right? That's... Whew. All right. So, another Old Testament miracle that I find interesting is fast-forwarding just slightly after the Israelites left Egypt. After they were told, hey, you didn't, you didn't go into the promised land like I told you and conquer it. The promised land that I gave, that I was, that was promising Abraham and his descendants. You guys didn't have enough faith in me and God to go conquer it. So now you're going to wander the desert for 40 years until a new generation comes. It's going to do what I say is God. And so now when the Israelites wandered, what happened? Aram, you want to read this? Aiden, go ahead. So even in their disobedience, God still blessed them. Wilderness, the wilderness they were, they were traveling in for 40 years was a very harsh climate. It was a desert. There were scarce resources. And yet through all their wanderings, the Israelites didn't have a bad leg day. Right? More than that, they, their clothing didn't wear out. Traditionally, at this time, the average person had two changes of clothes. That's it. You wear one, you wash the other. Carry it until you need it. And, and like when you need it is like after a few days, maybe a week, a couple weeks. It's, yeah. Yet the, well, I don't know. But yet the desert, over a course of 40 years, 40 years of walking, 40 years of sand, 40 years of scarce resources, the desert did not destroy their clothing. It did their clothing. It did not wear out. Maybe they had holy indestructible crocs. I don't know. <laughs> crocs are pretty holy to begin with. Ah! <laughs> Imagine having your favorite shirt for 40 years. Didn't wear out. But yeah, I don't know. They they went and conquered the promised land.
Don't know? God transforms their clothing so it does not wear out. Right. No spin cycle. No no rinsing cycle. Over 300 washes. Did not wa- did not wear out. I know. Right. But yeah, that's a pretty cool transformational miracle. I mean, when when we go to heaven and he gives us brand new robes, those white robes, I got to believe those don't wear out. No more long Amen. That's a reason to go to heaven and believe in Jesus just in and of itself. No more laundry. So, another famous transformational miracle in the New Testament. Can anyone guess it? Transformation. Yes. He got it. No, no, not quite. That's that's different. Water into wine. There's a water molecule into a wine molecule. Yeah. They both have similar atoms that make them up. Yeah. Here, here's here's another, like, doing my research in this, it was pretty fun. I got I to gotta say, like, going into this, like, man, I don't know how Jesus did this. It was a miracle. Yeah, it's a red wine molecule. This is like, okay, I got all these water molecules. How do we make them into wine molecules? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but this is cool. So, Jesus takes water, your basic H2O molecule, and turns it into wine so tasty that the person in charge of wine at this wedding had to give his two shekels. His, those were coins. You know, two cents. You know what? That's what I mean. Their opinion. So, Jesus turns water into wine. Karen, do you have this? Now there were six. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, "Fill the jars with water," and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, "Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast." So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. John 2, 6 through 11. Amen. Amen. So his disciples believed in him. After he did this first sign, this first miracle, by transforming that good old H2O water molecule to wine with like 20 or 30 gallons worth of water. Now... Look, I mean, to to unpack this, the master of the feast is a guy whose sole job, his sole responsibility is to make sure that everyone there is happy during this wedding celebration, which 2,000 years ago lasted seven days. Seven days. Like right now, we have wedding receptions that last a few hours. This one lasts seven days. And so, you have to keep these people fed. You have to keep these people watered. You have to keep these people drunk with wine. I don't know. But it was common practice 
And what he's saying here is that people would serve the good wine while, you know, they were all sober at first. They would serve the good wine first. And then when people were a little bit loopy, they bring out the cheap stuff because they don't know any better. And so, well, it was just a sensible thing to do. But, but, here, when Jesus takes this water that's used, by, mind you, for purification rituals, to purify, to make something holy, sacred, acceptable, he takes that water and turns it into wine. Uh, no, it's a wedding at Cana that he was invited to. So it was probably one of his friends and family. Well, Chosen does take some artistic liberties. Actually, we're going to see a short clip of the Chosen because you know, we'll see it later. But I do like the fact that Chosen gives a little bit more emotion into the story. It gives a visual. So many people just read their Bibles. Not enough people read their Bibles, but I do like the visual aspect of the Chosen. Yeah. Now, with that said, another good transformation miracle, and this one confuses a lot of people, even some diehard Christians, is the, fe is the fig tree that Jesus withered. The fig tree. Cameron, this one's shorter. You want to take a shot at this? Please? Now, he being Jesus, he comes to a fig tree expecting to eat. But it's not in season. He couldn't find any figs. And so he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. The next day, it was withered. It was dead. Well. Here's my point, and this is where a lot of people run into confusion. Why did Jesus do this to a tree? What did this tree ever do to you? Right? So, so why on earth would he... It's kind of a rando thing to do, right? He was looking for figs from this tree. But it says here that it was not the season for figs. So here we're presented two different things. Either Jesus did something wrong, which he didn't, or the tree did something wrong. Hold on, hold on. It wasn't. If God tells you to do something that is outside of your plan, should you change your plans to accommodate him, or should you go along with what you thought you should do to begin with? That's one of the lessons here. Because Jesus came to this tree. He, he knew it wasn't the season for figs before he got there. He knew that the figs that were either were supposed to be growing on that tree were not even ripe yet, if they were growing at all, but he couldn't find any. But he's God. He, with, he withered this fig tree transforming it from being fruitful when in season to never fruitful again. Because it did not submit to him when he wanted it to. Yes, we are supposed to be fruitful in and out of season. Yeah. I don't know. That's not, that's not part of today's lesson. 
And here's the thing. This lesson, it can be just like that with us. Take this tree and turn it into a person. If God has placed a calling in your life that is different from what you want to do, should you obey him or you? Because what happens when you obey God? After his disciples noticed the tree was withered later in the same chapter, he told them what? Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and, it does not doubt, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. People have a hard time connecting the fig tree lesson to this, because they don't understand the fig tree lesson. But if you're not moving in and out of season, where God wants to place you, this does not apply to you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a very good application. If, if sun, hold on, I'm talking. If you're only preaching about Jesus on Sunday to the congregation who already believes in Jesus, that's in season. Where are you talking about Jesus out of season? On the streets, in the mount, on the mountaintop. So that's a very good lesson. Yes, Cameron, what's your question? I don't know. Sounds like a miracle to me. So does anyone have any transformational miracle questions? I don't know. I think it can happen however God wants it to happen. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not Transformers, all right? Optimus Prime, not Jesus, all right? Mm hmm. All right. Yeah. All right, so now we've covered some transformational miracles in the Bible. Let's do some math. Multiplication miracles. Take a little bit of something, turn it into a lot of bit of something. So heading back to the Old Testament, we are checking in with Elisha. Now, if you don't know who he is, Elisha is a prophet of the Lord, and he was the prophet after Elijah. So, Elijah, Elisha. And Elisha comes to a widow and her son who are deeply in debt, they're in trouble, and he helps them out through a miracle. Watch this. Now, the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. So she's deeply in debt. She doesn't have a whole lot. She only has one jar of oil. And the creditor, the person she's indebted to, is about to take her two sons to be slaves. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all of your neighbors, Empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So, sounds pretty weird. Sounds like she, you know, he's, he's saying a miracle is going to happen. But she has to have faith that it's going to happen. 
Yeah. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live in the rest. So she had faith. She did what the prophet said, and they took this small jar of oil, and they filled every single vessel in the house and every single vessel that they borrowed. And then they were able to sell the oil, pay off the debt, and then live off the rest of that profit. Really cool multiplication miracle. Yeah. To multiply. Right. Or check. Or how about this example? You know, some of you haven't driven yet, but a majority of drivers have all prayed for that multiplication of gasoline miracle. (laughs) When you're almost on empty and you're heading to that gas station and God just multiply the gas until I get there. Because there was a need. And no hope of you getting to that gas station on, on, you know, with your ability until God moved. Until the, you know, until he filled your gas tank. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, like. That's the longest five miles to empty that I've been on. Right. Now, for the next miracle, going back to the wilderness. I like this miracle. It's one of my favorites, actually. Back when the Israelites were wandering the desert for 40 years, they were delivered from Egypt. But let's face it, if you read through Exodus... Israelites can be a little whiny. They're the epitome of the kid in the long car ride. I'm hungry. Are we there yet? I'm thirsty. Are we there yet? I need to go to the bathroom. When are we getting there? Are we there? And so they complained to Moses and Aaron. (laughs) And and at this stage, they're complaining that there's no no food. There's no meat. And then God showed up with a transformation and multiplication miracle. So in the evening, go ahead. Thank you. 
So, he, so here's our introduction to manna from heaven. Yes, there's food in heaven. Hallelujah. It's, it's, it, I, I am looking forward when I'm in heaven to pulling and reading my first manna-based cookbook. Um, but yeah, this is manna. It's supposed to taste like honeycomb. It's this fine flaking thing that they can bake. But they didn't just get manna. They started to also complain, I want meat. I want some chicken nuggets. So, so God sent them quail. Now, he didn't just send them a little bit of quail. He didn't just send them a lot of quail. He did a huge amount, like flocks and millions and millions of birds. I don't think we grasp just how much quail was provided. So, what? It's, it's a bird. It, it's, it's a bird. So, a little bit smaller than a chicken. So, how much quail did the Israelites get? We're going to do some math for multiplication miracles. Now, hold on. It says in Scripture, hold on, I've already done the math for you. All that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten omers. The H is silent sometimes. So you're thinking, okay, what's an omer? Well, you can actually calculate it using Scripture. And so, one omer, in traditional Jewish standards of measurement, the omer was equivalent to the volume of 43.2 chicken eggs. Now, they probably didn't have the large, triple-grade A eggs that we have today. They probably had just regular, medium-sized eggs. But that's a lot. One omer, and they each gathered ten... So that means 432 chicken eggs each person gathered worth of quail. Now, the question we've got to ask now is, how much does a chicken egg weigh? Well, if a medium-sized chicken egg weighs 21 ounces, you take 21, you multiply it by 432, that's 9,072 ounces that each person gathered, which is... If you convert ounces to pounds, 567 pounds of quail that each person gathered. That's insane. That is like, I will not me. I want chicken nuggets. And then God's like, I'm going to give you chicken nuggets. You're going to have chicken nuggets for months. You're going to never complain about chicken nuggets again. Get some quail nuggets. Right. They, they're in the desert. It will cook for a while if they just left it out. But yeah, you know, it's like, I want some quail fingers. You better believe there's a quail cookbook right alongside that manna cookbook. Millions and millions of quail. Multiplication here. So that was pretty cool. This is one of my favorite miracles because everyone had their workout that day, bringing in over 500 pounds of quail per person. Oh, yeah. And it's just like the quail, like this is an Israelite camp of millions of people. The quail had to be up to like here. Yeah, they were wading through quail. Just pile it in. But that's how big of a multiplication miracle and more that God can do. Meat. Now, if you're not familiar with this Old Testament one, let's do some multiplication miracles for a New Testament. And everyone knows this miracle. Fish and loaves. Now, now, yes. Everyone, everyone who's read the Old Testament likes this miracle. And like I was saying before, uh, everyone's read the New Testament. My apologies. My apologies. My apologies. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. It was a kid's, it was a kid's lunch. It was a snack. 
it wasn't even a big fish. It wasn't even a big fish. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. So, more than just five thousand, that's just counting the men. You're talking women and children. They had big families back then. You're probably doubling, if not more, that five thousand. And yet, They were all fed, they were all satisfied, they had leftovers, and they started with five loaves and two fish. Somewhere in here, multiplication miracle occurred. Now look, the loaves are barley loaves. Now look, like I said, I... uh, I do, you know, everyone's kind of familiar with this miracle... But I think the Angel Studios and The Chosen really did a fantastic, regardless of how you feel about it, they did a fantastic job of capturing the emotion of this miracle. So we're going to play this very short clip. This is wonderful bread that I'm No, it's not for me. I can go along. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it, 
they, they really captured the emotion of the moment, the mystery of the moment. And so, so 5,000 people were hungry. Some people may not have eaten for a whole day, maybe multiple days. And yet they didn't have a lot of food. They just had that snack. And they didn't have time to send everyone off to go eat somewhere. So they needed, a, they needed God to pull through, and he did. They needed a multiplication miracle, and it happened. Pretty cool. I don't know. All right, so all these miracles that we've discussed today, they're pretty incredible, right? There's no evidence of them today. We have to have faith that they happened, and it's pretty tough to believe sometimes. Some miracles, though, do have evidence. Sometimes, even 3,500 years later, we can figure out where something happened and bring it to life. Going back to when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness once again, if you were in a desert, I would imagine you would be pretty thirsty. Right? You'd want water. I'm, I'm thirsty, God! Moses, I'm thirsty! Well, our last miracle tonight not only covers what happened, but there is actual evidence that it happened. And that it's, that evidence still exists today. The water from the rock. So, and the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, where the water turned into blood, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So they were saying, We're thirsty. Is God with us? We're going to die out here. It's a desert. And God told Moses what to do. And he had to strike a rock. Now look. This would have to be a pretty big rock, right? Because, hold on, this would have to be a pretty big rock because you've got millions of Israelites. They're all thirsty. So, you've got to multiply water, and it's got to strike the rock, and water's going to come out. Now, this rock was thought lost. Now it might be found. This rock is near Jabal Makla, which we've, we've covered before. Jabal Makla, which means what? Anyone? Burnt Mountain. Jabal Makla. Jabal Makla is one of the mountains that is thought that could be Mount Sinai. And based on its geography, based on the, the mystery surrounding it with local Bedouins, and you know, local wandering people. And Makla, Jabal means mountain, Makla means burnt. So burnt mountain. Like when God descended upon the mountain in fire and smoke. I don't know. That's how he led them through the wilderness. But in the 1990s, this rock was discovered, or rediscovered, I should say. And so... It was found by Jim and Penny Caldwell, an American couple who lived in Saudi Arabia in the early 1990s. And this is in the wilderness, in the desert. And the Caldwells were told by the local Saudi Bedouins, the local wandering people, that it was known as Moses' water, that, that rock. Others who have visited the area have been more explicitly told that it is a split Rock of Moses. And when asked about the source of that name, the Bedouin said, it's been called that for generations. Where have you guys been? 
So sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And so when asking these local people, hey, you know, what's, this kind of looks cool. Yeah, that's a split rock of Moses. What? And then more than that, around this rock, in the area, carved into the very rock, proto-Hebraic inscriptions, he, you know, before the Hebrew written word, the language before that. Inscriptions on rocks near the split rock site can still be found. Multiple inscriptions were photographed by the Dowding Thomas Research Foundation. That's where you get this information. But, yeah, you can, it can be translated. But, here's the thing. Here's why people think this is the rock of Horeb, right? It's in the right place. It's the right geography. It kind of looks like it. But more than that, look at all around it here. Bingo. If you have water coming from a rock, it's going to flow. Look, it's miraculous, but it's going to behave like water. It's going to flow down. And so this shows a good indication of what's called water erosion. Water eroding away at the rock and following paths that water can take from this. I don't know. We don't know that. But what we can say is it's in the right place. It's got the right markers. It's got proto-Hebraic script all around it. And you've got water erosion. And it's been called that for generations. So look, critical thinking. Yeah. Critical thinking. What else could it be? What else could it be? The evidence is there. And if this miracle happened 3,500 years ago, and we can we could say it's there today, what's to say about the rest of them? It's transformational and multiplication. Depends on what you're talking about. Typically, a generation is anywhere from 25 to 70 years. But anyway, with that said, this all fits. This is a miracle that we could look at and just be like, hey, you know what? We have more than just Scripture. If you're really doubting, just take a look. Use some critical thinking skills. What else could it be? And so we're going to go into some more miracles as this series progresses. But I think this is a cool miracle capstone for today because, oh, wait, there's, there's evidence? And if there's evidence of this miracle, I think, I think I can have faith for the other ones. Has anyone learned anything today? Awesome. Anyone have any questions about multiplication miracles before we pray out. If I knew how to turn water into wine, I wouldn't be an insurance guy. <laughs> but I know it involves a miracle. So, all right, Aaron, do you want to pray us out?